Moon, do you remember us? We are coming back. The journey to the moon is surely the most extreme journey ever undertaken by a human being. And it is amazing to think how the astronauts of the Apollo generation managed to get as far as our satellite several times aboard spacecraft whose computers had the computing capacity of an old cell phone. Yet despite the technological limitations of the time, those men managed to prove the feasibility of a journey many thought impossible. Today, more than 50 years later with Artemis 1, we are attempting to repeat this incredible crossing with an initial launch that will serve primarily to demonstrate the launcher's ability to get to and from the moon safely, even dropping small CubeSats for scientific purposes into lunar orbit. It will also be crucial to test the behavior of the new Orion Command Module, one of the flagships of this program, which promises a great deal of autonomy and structural integrity, even in emergency situations, being able to ensure the survival of its passengers in critical situations to a safe landing. But all these would be empty words of meaning if today, November 16th, 2022, NASA's new and much discussed super rocket did not finally get off the ground, leaving behind all the doubts and fears that had accompanied the continuous postponements of recent months. What follows is a chronicle of what happened in those exciting hours, when much of the world was still immersed in sleep, unaware that at that moment the doors to the future were finally opening wide. That's right, dear friends, in front of thousands of people gathered since the night before at Cape Canaveral, the Artemis 1 mission finally lifted off from Ramp 39B at Kennedy Space Center at 1.47 a.m. local time on Wednesday, November 16th. At that moment, the four RS-25 engines, very reliable since they were literally ripped from the old space shuttle carcasses, and the two solid propellant boosters pushed upward the 2,700 tons of the space launch system or SLS, NASA's new 98-meter-tall carrier rocket. And with it, right at the top, the Orion, the new capsule that in future launches will be destined to house a crew of four astronauts. A kind of curse. But before we go on with the launch report, let's take a step back to summarize the whole incredible chain of adverse circumstances that delayed the start of this amazing undertaking by two and a half months. You will undoubtedly recall that last August 29th, NASA had to abort the launch of Artemis 1 because of a problem in the rocket's first stage refueling system, an inconvenience that then recurred on September 3rd when a new start was attempted without success. Thus, it became necessary in order not to leave it exposed to the elements to move the space launch system from the launch pad to the vehicle assembly building, the large building where the rocket is assembled and configured. After some maintenance activities, the rocket was brought back to the launch pad last November 4th, and as if that were not enough, in the following days it had to contend with strong winds from Nicole, the tropical storm that was sweeping across Florida and part of the southeastern United States. Bringing the rocket back to the vehicle assembly building would have meant the further postponement of the launch, which is why NASA engineers chose not to change plans even though they were aware that they faced some additional risks related to the difficult weather conditions. Once the storm passed, NASA postponed the launch for a couple of days from November 14th to November 16th, and then conducted the necessary checks to ensure that the rocket and all systems had not been damaged. When the checks were completed earlier this week, space agency officials finally gave their go-ahead to continue with the necessary procedures to prepare for launch. The checks, in fact, led to the identification of some minor damage, but not such as to affect the functionality of the rocket and the safety of the launch in general. At least, we are on the way. So finally, on November 16th, the space launch system managed to fire its engines and lift it off from the ground, accelerating rapidly despite a total mass equal to that of 100 TIRs. Two minutes and 12 seconds after liftoff, at an altitude of 48,000 meters, the side boosters of the massive launch system shut down and then disengaged, falling into the sea. And after 8 minutes and 16 seconds, it was the main stage of the giant carrier rocket that was undocked from the Orion. After that, the capsule together with the second stage and the surface module went into a parking orbit at an altitude of about 200 kilometers. After a couple of circles around the Earth, 
The solar panels opened at the appropriate time, and at about 3.20 a.m. after an hour and 33 minutes of flight, the second stage fired its engine for 18 very long minutes, giving the Orion and its service module all the thrust it needed to leave Earth's orbit and put the spacecraft on a trajectory towards the moon. After two hours and six minutes at about 3.53 a.m., the launch phase of Artemis 1 officially ended with the separation of the Orion capsule from the now inert second stage. And at this point, Orion found itself on a course toward the moon. This maneuver, named Transfer Lunar Injection, was one of the most critical phases of the mission. Indeed, timing in firing the engines is critical to intercepting the moon along its orbit around the Earth. This allows the spacecraft to enter the lunar gravitational sphere of influence, a region of space within which our satellite's attraction is dominant over Earth's. A delay or an advance of a few minutes in the maneuver could have led to a trajectory error such that the spacecraft would have been lost beyond the orbit of our satellite. Hang on a sec guys before we continue. Be sure to join the Insane Curiosity channel. Click on the bell, you will help us to make products of even higher quality. What will happen from today onward? So far, this is the chronicle of what happened on the morning of November 16th. But the mission will, of course, continue in the coming days. So all that remains for us to do is to list everything that will happen from that date onward, hoping that everything will continue to work excellently as it has so far. After the Orion capsule enters the path to the moon, the third stage will be abandoned and the phase of the journey called Transfer Lunar Orbit will begin, which will bring the capsule within sight of our satellite within three days. At that point, on November 25th, the engines will be turned on again to slow the spacecraft down and insert it into circumlunar orbit. This maneuver is called lunar orbit insertion. After circumnavigating our satellite while releasing the 10 CubeSat satellites, which represent the secondary science payload, Orion will enter a special orbit called the Distant Retrograde Orbit. This orbit, which has never been used before, is found to be extremely stable with respect to orbital perturbations as it interacts with the L1 and L2 Lagrangian points of the Earth-Moon system, and will be the orbit that will follow the Lunar Gateway or Lunar Space Station in future missions, which will be built starting in 2023. This station will support all Artemis missions starting with Artemis 4 and provide support for all future missions to the Moon and then to Mars. The orbital variant will take Orion 60,000 kilometers away from the Moon, thus breaking the distance record achieved by Apollo 13 in 1970. After six days, the Orion capsule will exit the distant retrograde orbit with another lunar flyby, which will finally push it on to its home course. From that point, it will take about a week to return to Earth. Re-entry into the atmosphere after Orion's separation from the European Service Module which will be done at a few thousand kilometers altitude, will take place at a speed of 11 kilometers per second, 32 times the speed of sound. It will be friction that will produce a deceleration of the capsule of up to 9G, and as a result, an increase in the temperature of the heat shield to 2800 degrees Celsius. Then, at an altitude of about 8 kilometers, Orion will open its 11 parachutes, and if all goes as planned, will dive into the Pacific Ocean off the coast of California when it is just past midnight in Florida on December 11th. The recovery team will arrive at the capsule from a San Antonio-class Navy ship and will test extraction procedures ahead of the launch with Artemis II astronauts. Is no one on board? So when are the human crews? On board Artemis I, we repeat again, there are no astronauts. As a result, life support, displays, and control instrumentation have been removed from the capsule. In its place are sensors and scientific instruments capable of detecting every single parameter inside the capsule, such as radiation levels, pressures, and temperatures. On board, however, there will be dummies on which sensors are placed to monitor all the radiation levels they will experience. The name chosen for the main mannequin, Commander Munikin Campos, goes to pay homage to the famous engineer of the Apollo 13 mission, the one who played a key role in bringing astronauts Jim Lovell Jack Swigert and Fred Hayes safely back to Earth, after an explosion in the service module not only thwarted the lunar landing but also put a strain on the simple re-entry. Munikin Campos will wear the same spacesuit that the astronauts will use and will be equipped with an array of sensors that can measure several useful parameters, 
such as acceleration values during the various phases of the journey, the vibrations to which the crew members will be subjected, and the level of radiation. Campos will not be alone. Joining him will be Zolgar and Helga, two human torsos similar to those normally used for ballistic trauma simulations. If Artemis 1 is indeed a success, in the next few years the Artemis 2 mission will repeat essentially the same activities, but with a crew of four on board Orion. Not until 2026 with the Artemis 3 mission is the actual lunar landing planned, with the first black astronaut and astronaut walking the lunar surface. There are still many uncertainties, however, in this regard. As of today, in fact, the Artemis program does not yet have a system for the lunar landing. On the Apollo missions, the descent module, LEM, was transported from Earth to the Moon along with the rest of the instrumentation. Orion, on the other hand, travels without vehicles to perform a lunar landing. NASA has tasked Elon Musk's private space company, SpaceX, with providing this transition, with a nearly $3 billion contract to make its Starship spacecraft compatible with lunar activities. Starship has long been under development at the Large Launch Site base in Texas, where SpaceX has focused much of its activities but has never reached Earth orbit. Musk has repeatedly given optimistic predictions about the first orbital flight, but to date the system is in the testing phase and has experienced some delays. In the future, however, Starship could become a much more practical and economical way to reach the Moon than Space Launch System. In fact, SpaceX's Starship is designed to do everything by itself. Start from Earth, travel to the Moon, make the lunar landing and return. It is also reusable, so it could make trips to the Moon extremely cheaper, but it has yet to prove that it can work. A simplified version will be used for the first Artemis missions to handle only crew transfers from the future gateway in lunar orbit to the Moon. Will it all work out? Of course, it will. And from the moment Commander Munikin Campos emerges safely from the capsule on December 11th, we will begin to count the months in that time until the launch of Artemis II, the mission that will take men to circumnavigate the moon for the first time since 1972. A mission that will remind us very closely of the fantastic feat of Apollo 8 in Christmas of 1968. And just like then, yes, it will be all right.